Um, this morning, the title of my sermon is Death and Life. And it's not going to be what you think it is. We're not going to be talking about actual death and life. We're going to be actually talking about something different. And uh, so if you have your Bibles, open your Bibles up to Proverbs chapter 18. And verse 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. So did you get that? There is death and there is life in what you say. You have the ability to bring life by speaking it or bringing death to someone. And once, you know, there's an old cliche out there, once it's out there, it's out there and you can't take it back. That's, yeah, that's very, that's very true. That's actually totally true. The thing that I never got, um, actually, ironically, when you think about it, this is kind of unusual. The tongue is a muscle, right? But have you ever heard of anybody saying that their tongue is tired? The tongue is like the only muscle I know of that never gets tired. <laughs> Especially, you know, you get some of these uh, people, they can talk and talk. You know, Seinfeld used to have a bunch of skits with that. There was the close talker, somebody who always talked too close to you. And then there was the low talker. And I've experienced those both. You're trying to have a discussion with somebody's talking like this. How's it going? Yeah. You know, excuse me? I said, you know. Well, I'm sorry, what? You know, you gotta keep doing that. But uh, I, you know, th this is a. I think uh, it should be the too much talker because you know they just keep talking and talking. You ever go to corner in a conversation and you have to do something and they just keep talking and talking and you're like, okay, you're thinking in your head, I have to be polite. You know, I'm a Christian, but please stop circling the airport and land the plane. It's <laughs> killing me. But anyway, um, and, and, and also, uh, by the way, that whoever said that old uh, sticks and stones will break my bones and words will never hurt me, obviously never read their Bible or obviously was never actually hurt. Because uh, you could tell when somebody was really hurt from that also, because what is the response to that, if you remember? Does anybody remember? When somebody said that, you would say, well, I'm rubber and you're glue. Whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks to you. <laughs> but the reality is, words really do hurt. I guess that's why somebody came up with that, I'm rubber and you're glue, right? Because when you say something and, and it's out there, it really, we really can uh, hurt somebody. You can actually even just get hurt by somebody um, forgetting your name. Has that ever happened to you? You've known somebody for a long time, and then they'll just say, uh, hey, Phyllis. And you're like, but my name is Dawn. You know, and you get really, you can get, just get hurt from an error like that, from a mistake like that. Years ago, there was a show called Parks and Recreation, and there was a character on there, his name was Ron, and, uh, <laughs> When uh, one day he's on the show and the girl's name wasn't Alice, I forgot what her name was, and she said, he said, well, thank you, Alice. And she had such hurt in her eyes. And then he turns to the camera and he says, when people get too chummy with me, I like to call them by the wrong name to let them know I really don't care about them. I'm like, wow, this guy's pretty brutal, you know? Wow. Such a subtle and brutal way. But the whole point is, he knew by doing that, he can actually hurt that person. And then he can keep this distance from that person by hurting that person and saying that. James chapter 3, verse uh, 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. And that's just telling us right there in Scripture that a teacher will be judged by God in the end. For what he taught. So like whatever is said in a church or in a body, if I start this cult idea of, of some, you know, weird thing like, you know, at the end of service we have to start sacrificing squirrels in the parking lot because that's what we have to do and I'm misleading you, you see? And that's not in the word of God. I'm taking you down the wrong path. In the end, let's say nothing happens, you guys live your lives and you die, I have to answer to God for that. Because that's something that I said that wasn't scriptural. So that's what he's saying there in James. He's saying, uh, for we teach will be judged more strictly. Verse 2, indeed we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect. And could also control ourselves in every other way. And this is interesting here too, because I think this is just one way we can seek perfection. 
And now when we hear that word in the English culture, we think that's impossible. That, what are you talking about? Per perfection. But Jesus said in Matthew 5.48, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as our Father in heaven is perfect. So we're always to strive to be the best Christian we are. And the perfect example, the perfect model who we should always strive after is not a man, it's not a woman, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. So anyway, um, so verse 3, we can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, and this is important here, corrupting your entire body. You, what you say can corrupt your entire body. Are you a liar? Are you somebody who likes lying and lying and lying? That starts to affect your spirit and your soul eventually. And that has an effect on you because then it starts to affect your testimony. And when that starts to affect the testimony, then you're pretty much worthless as a believer if you're going out there saying, I love Jesus, and you're saying something else, right? So, um, verse 8, but no one can tame the, uh, um, sorry, uh, corrupting the, your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so, blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Sorry, that, that was a little long, but I wanted to get that point, because that's a very important scripture. To sum up this scripture, basically, your tongue is you. That's what he's saying here. You see, because just like the ship has that rudder, and just like the horse has the bit, whatever comes out of your mouth is steering you in that direction that is either godly or not godly. You follow? So let's remember that. Uh, how you use your tongue can shape you as a person inside and how other people see you as well. It can injure not just someone else's life by what you say, but it can injure your life as well. You know, it's the funny thing is, like, you'll have people standing around and they'll be like cursing and cursing and cursing, and then somebody will say, hey, you shouldn't be doing that in front of a pastor. And they'll go, what? You're a pastor? And then their whole attitude changes. What, why, why is, what makes that different just because they found out I'm a pastor? Well, they find out that I'm a Christian sometimes. You know, sometimes I'll just, they don't know me, and they'll say it, take God's name in vain, and I'll say, hey, God's last name is not Dan. Whoa, whoa, what are, you, whoa, what are you, one of those Christians? Yeah, yeah, I am one of those Christians. Oh, then their whole attitude changes. You see, now, I'm either bringing life, or I'm speaking death into that person's life, you see, by what I say. Um... You know, and then of course, you know, after, you know, sometimes like curses their brains out, they'd be like, oh yeah, by the way, I'm saved too. <laughs> now, okay. You see, again, what you say is either life or death. After I've seen you live your life the past three years, now all of a sudden you're going to tell me that you're saved. The fruit is not there. I don't see the fruit. You're, I don't know what tree you come from, but it's not that. Um, I do find it interesting that the scripture always puts liars and murderers in the same category, that there's no difference to God. Revelation 21.8 says, but cowards, unbelievers, uh, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Isn't that interesting that that, a lie, which in our culture today doesn't seem like to be a big deal, huh? Oh, come on, it's just a white lie. Remember that? It was that old um, Geico commercial where he used to come on, you know, Geico saves you money for such and such. It's like, just like a, 
Abraham Lincoln is honest. And they showed like this ancient footage of Abraham Lincoln. And she says, honey, does this dress make me look big? And Abraham Lincoln's standing there and he's going, uh, well, he goes like this and she gets furious with him. And then, you know, of course, the footage cuts off and everything. It was really, it was done pretty cleverly. But a lot of times in our culture, we think, well, maybe if I throw that little white lie out there, it won't hurt that person, and I'm protecting that person anyway. Well, it has its consequences, and, and this is just like what Satan did to us, too, right? A false testimony is lying. Lying is lying. So um, as believers, we know we should watch what we say. As believers, we love to point out the finger of other people outside the body of Christ too, which is something we should be doing and talking about, you know? Well, that person's not saved. He's just going to, you know, go, he's, what is the, uh, the old expression? He's in a hell, uh, handbag to hell? Uh, hell in a handbasket. To what, go to hell in a handbasket. Yeah, he's going to hell in a handbasket, which I never understood either, because who fits in a handbasket? <laughs> why would you go in a handbasket to hell? You know? I mean, <laughs> take a Ferrari with you. I mean, come on. Anyway. So, uh, but gossip is a part of that too. Gossip and lying is the same thing. It's, and by the way, gossip is known as idle talk. And what is idle talk? Idle talk is defined in the dictionary as irrelevant. Idle can also mean having no value or purpose. So when you're talking about someone else, whether you're at work or somewhere in church or something, and you know you, that's considered idle talk, which is a sin. And this is why gossip is a sin. So again, what you say, you can be talking about somebody and saying something, but it has no truth to it because you don't have the facts. And you're, you know, this this happens in politics all the time. The politicians are. You know, neither here nor there, but uh, you know, but that you're destroying that person's reputation. But by the way, you know, just to throw this out there, how come nobody ever gossips about themselves? Right? You never heard somebody come up to you, hey, how's it going? Yeah, boy, did I tell you what happened to me? <laughs> did I tell you? Yeah, I know, right, the suit, yeah, really cheap looking, right? Yeah, I got it in Toys R Us. It looks like, you know, the Johnny Cash doll collection or something like that. Yeah, I look horrible, don't I? I tell you. Nobody ever gossips about themselves. It's always because they want to make themselves you know, higher on the pedestal there and make that other person feel lower. So this way we'll talk something bad about that person and I see I feel good because that person now is low, which is not really very godly. Um, in the past, uh, I've been in ministry for like 32 years now and I have had many things happen to me in church and I've had many things, I've seen many things happen to really, really nice godly people in church. And I've given you this example. This is the first example. Um, one time uh, I had a, a kitchen company that I started right out of college, and the company wasn't doing well, and a woman in the church came up to me, and she prophesied over me and my partner and said that the company was going to do very well, we were going to make millions of dollars, and with the company, we were going to be able to build a church and start a ministry through that and use the money for the successful you know, company and do that. Well, that never came to pass. Okay, so again, what you say can bring either life or death. What she actually brought was death because now she's a false prophet and I should have stoned her. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you should have stones in the foyer, right? Maybe, right? Full prophet, get her! All right, throw it. Um, but no, seriously, now that person's testimony and reputation, again, because think about this. If I went and I said, Brother Tom said this, and Brother Tom never said that, He's going to be mad at me. But yet, we in the church do that a lot with God. Amen. We say God says something, and God never said it. And what do you think God's response is to that? Whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't put my name on that. Don't you put my name on that. I never said that. But we do that all the time, don't we? Yeah. About 15 years ago, I worked in a church, and um, I was the associate pastor. And there was a woman in the church that would prophesy. And I have nothing against prophecy. I believe in prophecy 100%. I believe in the gift of tongues also. But this woman, every time she got up, she would give a prophecy, and then she would interpret the, the, the prophecy, the tongues, uh, and it would be castigating the church. No, no. And everything, every time, it was always just putting, you, you're sinners, you know, you're this, you're that. And so finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I went to the senior pastor, and I said, look, you've got to stop this. 
And he was like, why? I'm like, what do you mean, why? 1 Corinthians 14, 4 says he speaks, if you, when you speak in a tongue, it is meant for edification. Yeah. Do you know what an edifice is? An edifice is, edifies is where we get in our English language, the edifice. It means to hold up. It means to build up. Yeah. We're not building the church up when every week she's castigating the church. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. That, again, brings death. Because mm -hmm. people are sitting in the congregation thinking, oh, I'm just pretty much nothing. God, you know, he's, God's mad at me again. You know? And that's not true because God never said that. Because if you're going to use scripture and you're going to use the gift of tongues, that's what you have to do. By the way, the word edifies in the Greek is oi koto om eho. Say that three times fast. <laughs> it means to be a house builder, to construct and to build up. So remember, a person who says they're speaking for God and is not will be judged by God for lying that God said something he did not say. Amen. That's important too, right? Anyway, and the reason why lying makes God so angry, you know the question, you know the answer rather, it's Satan. He's known in scripture as the father of lies. He's opposed God's creation since the beginning. His lie separated the angels from heaven and pulled a third of the angels out of heaven. His lie destroyed Adam and Eve and look where we are now. Amen. This is why lying to God is not gray. It's black or white. And there's right. no such thing as a white lie. It's just a lie. Yep. So anyway, so, uh, you know, um, let me show you the contrast, though. Do you know what the first three things that Jesus, the Lord Jesus said on the cross was? The first three things he said? The first thing he said was, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. He's on the cross, people. He's being crucified, and instead of yelling out in hate, like maybe some of us would, being angry, being concerned about ourselves, okay, okay, I renege, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a king, take me off the cross. No, his first thought, his first thing he says on the cross is, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. The second thing the Lord Jesus says on the cross is, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. He turns to a thief, a sinner, a person who the culture has deemed to be dead, and he says, you're going to be the first person in paradise with me. And the third thing the Lord Jesus says on the cross is, dear woman, here is your son. He said to this disciple, here is your mother. Now, the beautiful thing about that is, again, He's on the cross, he's dying for the sins of the world, yet he's still concerned about what's going to happen to his mother when he's gone. He knew that every disciple, James, his brother, who wrote the book of James, Jude, who wrote the book of Jude, all the disciples would be martyred. So he speaks to John, who lives in his 90s, and who dies a natural death eventually, and says, this is my mom, she's your mom now. Son, this is your mother. Now, I bring that up because this is who Jesus really was inside. See, he talked about how a believer should live. He talked about when somebody says something, this is what you should be. Let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Amen. Proverbs 18 and 20 says, A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Think about this scripture, church. Think about it for a moment. A person's words are figuratively called the fruit of his mouth and the harvest from his lips. They can benefit himself uh, with being positive and uplifting or tearing down and being destructive on what they say. And, you know... Sometimes we honestly just don't realize the impact our words have sometimes. I mean, you know, like I said, our tongue is the only muscle that doesn't get tired and we just keep talking and talking and talking and sometimes we don't even like listening and we keep talking and we just talk and we talk and we talk and, we talk and, we talk and the person's saying, okay, okay. But see, think about, you know, you've heard this expression when you were a kid, think about what you're going to say before you say it. And you know, my parents used to tell me, but 
I'm not geared that way. My brother is geared in a different way where he gets mad, he reacts. You know, he'll just, that's it, you're done. <sighs> you know, whereas I think about the consequences of what I'm going to do and then what's going to happen. Would that be a wise thing to do? Would that not be a wise thing to do? Okay, let me say it this way. You know, but Mark chapter 5, I want to show you the impact words can have. Mark chapter 5, verse 22. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. Now I want to stop just for one second and think about this now. Because what happens next, probably through this man's soul and his spirit on a, on, on a tizzy. Think about your parent. Your child is dying. You get to meet this man who you've heard, Jesus Christ is the healer, and you're going to find him. And when you find him, he says he's going. You're excited, and then all of a sudden, a woman with an issue of blood gets his attention. And you're pulled away from this conversation now, and it's different now because now he's focusing on this woman, and he's like, where, where did my power go? And the disciples are like, what do you mean? All these people are standing around here asking me where? You know, you know, where'd your power go? And he's now caught up with this woman now. Wow, you know, what faith do you have? And now it's too late. Because what happens now is while he's still speaking with her, messengers arrive and they tell Jairus, look. Don't bother with the master anymore. She's dead. Can you imagine how that man's heart felt? It's hopeless. It's, it's gone. Uh, I, I tried. If, if she wouldn't have interrupted, maybe we would have had a little more time. Just the thought of what was in that man's mind. And we know that he was afraid because the next scripture tells us what the Lord Jesus says. He turns his attention back to the man. And scripture says in verse 36, but Jesus overheard them. And he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith. Wow. Can you imagine? He goes from the words of death. She's done. She's dead. She's passed away. Don't bother him anymore. To the words of life. No. No. Don't be afraid. Just have faith. The power our words can have. Yeah. The life that our words can bring into someone's life. Matthew 15, 11 says, It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. What defiles a man is what comes out of your mouth, not in. So the Pharisees were so concerned with outward appearance and covering up the outside and taking, this is how I look and I have the right garbs on and I wash my hands and I have this and I have that. And they weren't concerned about what comes out of your mouth, what you're teaching the people, what you're telling the church. Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth, again, you're using your tongue there, right? The Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. It is that verbal confession that you use with your tongue that you bring life into your life now because you've confessed now that the Lord Jesus is your Savior. So with our tongues, we can choose life and confess. In this life, you can choose to speak life or death, but in the end, your last words will be the truth because the Bible says in the end, what? Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So you're an atheist? You think God doesn't exist? In the end, you're going to be on your knees. You're going to say Jesus Christ is Lord. You're an agnostic? Or you never wanted anything to do with God, and then you thought maybe you could get away with it on your deathbed, and you say, ah, you know, I'll do wait till the end there. It's too late. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we can choose life by accepting him, or we could choose death by not saying anything or confessing our sins to the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 12, 36 says, But I say to you that for every idle 
word. Men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. Remember when we were talking about that idle word called gossip? Not just gossip, but every idle word. You know, I'll take care of you. You're struggling and everything, I promise you, I'm going to help you out. I'm, I'm going to Australia forever, so I'm going to have to see her again. <laughs> you know? You say things. Now, I just brought life. There's hope. But then because I lied, that's totally different. I just destroyed my testimony. It's, it's out the window. So, real quickly, let's just end on a positive note. Let's talk about life. Proverbs 12, 14 says, From the fruit of his lips, a man is filled with good things, as surely as the work of his hands rewards him. So, fruit of your mouth, your words, when a man speaks well and uplifts his tongue, right? Uh, that is like a farmer. Whatever he's planting, he's gonna, if he puts that seed in the ground and he takes care of it, that's what's gonna grow. Amen? Amen. So let's just look at a few scriptures, for example, of a good example of, of fruit in our lives that will have a, a great, positive, blessed uh, effect in our lives. Psalms 92, uh, Psalms 29, 2. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Psalm 95, 6. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord and our Maker. Did you know that when you worship and you're standing there lifting your hands up and you're giving your heart to God and you're saying with your mouth, Lord, you are Lord of all, and you're saying those words, you are bringing life into your spirit. Worship isn't just singing. It's more than that. It's more powerful than that. Let never forget it was the, the the worship team in the Bible days that was in front of the army of Israel yeah. worshiping. Wow, can you imagine that being a musician back then? <laughs> yeah, you know what? I'm going to take up spears. I'm not going to be on the worship team anymore. Sister Abby, I'm sorry. I'm done. I, I love playing, but no, I think I'm going to be in the back. I, I think fighting with my shield and everything is better. Thanks a lot for the young. And there's the worship team with a flute, you know, right in front of another army with spears and swords and knives. But the power that it has, Amen. what you say, when you pour your heart out to God and you talk to him in prayer, you're pouring life into your spirit and into your soul. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 35 says, every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. So you see, everything God has said is true. Everything God has said is good. Everything God has said benefits each and every one of you here. Because why? Because he cares for you. Because he loves you. And every word of God when he speaks is a testimony of the fruit of God's mouth. This is why when Christ was on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. You will be with me in paradise. Woman, this is your son. Son, this is your woman. That, that's God. He's concerned about others, and he's not selfish about himself. He was selfless, amen? amen. John 6, 5, 1, 51 says, I am the living bread, which came down from heaven, this is the Lord Jesus speaking. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Christ is telling us, I'm the real true bread. When I die on the cross, I'll take on all your sins. When my side is pierced, when my hands are pierced, when my feet are pierced, my flesh, which is the bread of life, will bring life to you. And you can exist forever and ever with me in eternity. That spiritual bread is the most important thing we need in our lives. Now, I know some of us, you know, I, I grew up on a Italian bread from um, the Bronx. And it's, uh, I can't believe it's the, 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 the company slipping my, uh, 
the street it came off of either. But anyway, uh, we would go to the bakery in Northport and he would have it shipped in from the Bronx on like Wednesdays and Saturdays. And I'm telling you, I'm not exaggerating. The bread from the Bronx all the way to Northport was still hot. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, you buy a piece of Italian bread this big, like my grandpa used to say, man, that's good. Put some butter in that thing, man. And I'm telling you, you can literally go through that whole Italian bread because it's so hot and so delicious. Well, spiritually, that's what Christ is to us. Because he's just that, that aroma, that, that scent, that taste, that, that feeling of life and love. That's what Christ is in our lives. So I'm going to close with this scripture. And uh, it's going to be Luke chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, but Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So if you want your life to continually be sprouting, if you want your life to continually be growing, if you want your life to continually be uh, flourishing, every word of God is that seed, that water. That can bless us.